In today's session, we will be talking about Objective C, which is the de facto language for app development in iOS. We will be opening, creating projects in Xcode, working on Xcode, and uh, building a very small basic app just so that you have an understanding of how to work with the ID and use the uh, SDK and uh, the language. And the objectives of today's session are learn the basics of this language. It's a new language, so we'll try to uh, you know cover the basics. We will also be talking about uh, some specific features of this language, two of which are uh, categories and extensions. And uh, simultaneously, we will also be working on Xcode. Here's a brief uh, overview of Objective C. Yes, it's a new language to learn, but uh, it, it's actually a strict uh, superset of C. So it's not all that um, different, and um, it started from C. So uh, basically, which means for you, for the programmer, you can. It is possible to compile a C program with with the Objective-C compiler, it won't crash. And so uh, what it means is you can also use uh, freely use C code within an Objective-C class. Although C is not an object-oriented language, uh, it's a procedural language, but still since uh, Objective-C has been derived from, uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, it encompasses C, so you have uh, that uh, advantage. Of course, it's an object-oriented language, so it adds its own syntax for classes, methods, and uh, other uh, OOPS concepts. However, a few things to think differently about would be uh, properties, uh, dynamic binding, and other such features. What are these? We will talk about them uh, as we continue with our uh, learning. So Objective-C follows the ANSI-C style coding, uh, but it has methods borrowed from Smalltalk. Smalltalk is the, um, it's the object-oriented language, and uh, basically Objective-C has got its roots both in C and Smalltalk. So it combines the power of both, and uh, it's a very, very flexible language. Uh, like most of, almost everything is done at runtime, which gives great flexibility to the programmer. Um, terms like dynamic binding, dynamic typing, dynamic linking, these are uh, um, concepts which uh, this language uses much to the advantage of uh, the programmer and also the engine. So um, if you have come from, uh, you know, like I said, from an object-oriented programming background, especially Java, you would be aware of a uh, few of these features. Like, for example, dynamic binding or late binding, this is used for uh, you know, it's used uh, to enable polymorphism. Polymorphism is a feature of, um, say, it gives, um, of giving different functionalities to um, different sets of classes. So, for example, if I have a base class, a shape, and uh, then I have two subclasses, say, square and circle, which get derived from the base class uh, shape, and each of them have their own uh, methods for drawing. So uh, with this feature, with dynamic binding, the programmer need not bind the uh, objects uh, at compile time when he's coding or when he's compiling the program. So um, I, you can have situations where at code, at, uh, you know, during compile time, uh, you need, need not know the, um, the object which is, uh, you know, being invoked and which object's draw method is being invoked. So these are, what is the advantage of this? Basically, in situations where, there are situations where you would not necessarily know what object you're getting. So in that case, uh, your program will not crash. And uh, because of this feature, because of the late binding feature, it will still accept it and um, run it smoothly. So if the object that you have got is a square, then it will invoke the draw method of that particular object. And if it's a circle, then, you know, the corresponding draw method of circle. So these are some very, uh, you know, um, good features which give flexibility to this language. Dynamic typing is, again, um, 
it's the class. So basically, just like how we said, we need not know uh, the method uh, which object it belongs to. Uh, there is also this feature wherein um, when you're writing the code, you need not even know the type of class. So um, the um, keyword for this is ID. Um, what I can do is I can uh, take you to say Xcode. I can just show you this uh, feature here. Please ignore this code. I will just uh, type in say yeah. So when I say ID this is a recognized keyword, right? So it means a pointer to an instance of a class, right? And if you click on more, see this is how you invoke the documentation with an Xcode. Yes, it says ID is a pointer to an instance of a class. Now what this means is, normally if we were to call an object in um, Objective-C, we need to um, say for example if I say N is object, we heard about this class yesterday. It is the root class for all objects, right? So uh, let's say N is object OBJ test, right? Now I I am fine with this uh, declaration because I know this is a pointer to NS object. But there are instances, there are uh, occasions where you do not know what is the object type, what is the class type of this object. So in that case, you can simply write, replace it with ID. This means it can be a class of any type. You need not declare it at compile time. And uh, please ignore this error because you, we have not initiated it, so that's, that's why the compiler is crying, but otherwise it's a perfectly valid uh, recognized keyword in uh, Objective-C and it helps us to bind classes at runtime. So that is dy dynamic typing for you. And dynamic linking is, you would have heard about DLLs, right? So uh, typically your executables or your dynamic link libraries can also be by, bound at runtime. You need not hard code them or, you know, fix them at compile time. So combined with all these uh, features, um, it contributes to uh, making Objective-C very flexible. It's a very flexible language. Okay, so how did Objective-C come about? a little bit into the history of uh, programming language development. Uh, Objective-C was invented by two men, Brad Cox and Tom Love, and both were introduced to small talk at ITT, that is a place where they were working, and this was in the early 80s. So ITT is, uh, I think it stands for International Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, Corp, and it still exists today, so these two men they were working there and uh, Cox thought something like small talk because at that time they were working on small talk and uh, he thought that you know something like this would be very useful for application development and so he modified a C compiler and um, by 1983 he had a working object oriented extension to C and he called it OOPC and then when Tom was working with uh, Schlumberger research he acquired a commercial copy of Smalltalk 80 and with direct access to Smalltalk he added his own uh, features to uh, this language, uh, this extension of C and uh, called it, finally the product was named Objective-C. And they were market ready by 1986 and released it through their own company called as Stepstone. Now, as you know, um, in 1985, Next was founded by uh, Steve Jobs, who was the Apple computer co-founder. And uh, he did this after he was forced out of Apple. So uh, he took his, uh, you know, a select few uh, people from um, Apple and uh, together with his team, they, um, you know, they were um, building the Next Step operating system. 
and so the uh, when the you know when he was um, uh, when he came across this language objective C, he uh, they decided to acquire it and uh, make the interface design for next step uh, in this language uh, because they um, had seen the features and they thought that it's a wise fit for the operating system. So um, by the way, next step was derived from BSD Unix. And so in 1995, Next got full rights to Objective C from Stepstone. And um, when you talk about interface design, uh, the dog that you see on uh, you know your Mac, or say in Windows, uh, so this is a dog, right? You can dock your applications here. And similarly, in Windows, you have the taskbar. So that and um, you know other other features like shelf. So these came from Objective C, and they were, you know, very unique features at that point in time, uh, which Next Step, um, you know, introduced in its uh, operating system, and uh, and so in 1995 they got the full rights to Objective Objective C from Stepstone. Stone, sorry. Now, how did the OpenStep API come into picture? So it was developed in 1993 by both Next and Sun, and uh, the um, idea behind it was to make um, something like Next Step um, and its Objective C implementation available to other platforms. So in order to be OS independent, uh, what they started doing was separate the higher level libraries uh, from the core um, OS. And this, in turn, removed the dependency on the Mac kernel. And uh, they made the low-level data into classes. And so, because of this, um, uh, you know, it, uh, the classes and uh, the API came out from the operating system. And, the, uh, and it became OS independent. And this, in turn, paved the way for uh, Mac OS X and GNU Step. Both took uh, different directions, and uh, one was from Apple and one was from uh, GNU. So that's how the OpenStep API came about. And uh, as we know, uh, in 1996, Next was taken over by Apple, and uh, Steve Jobs again became the uh, head of Apple. He became the CEO, and uh, then they put um, you know him and his Objective C libraries to work. And this resulted in, you know, redesigning the complete Mac OS to use Objective-C similar to that of NextStep. And uh, during this course, they developed a collection of libraries named Coco. So that's where, you know, uh, Coco's, uh, Coco was born. And uh, this was um, to aid GUI development primarily. So Mac OS X uh, was, uh, it was radically different than the previous versions and it was released in March 2001. It was earlier called as Rhapsody and uh, primarily it was for uh, Apple's uh, main market of creative professionals and home users. Yes, the Coco API. Uh, it's primarily the most frequently used frameworks and it was developed by Apple from NextStep and OpenStep and uh, it has a set of predefined classes and types such as ns number ns string ns date etc and um, yes ns stands for next and sun uh, it's uh, to honor sun's contribution uh, in the development of this api and the root class of this uh, api is ns object and this is where um, words like alloc retain and release are derived Basically, alloc, retain, release, they all have to uh, do with the object life cycle, as you would have guessed. So because um, Objective-C has automatic uh, reference counting and it has its own memory management, so these words, uh, these uh, keywords are used in that context. And um, basically, Coco API is um, what is developed by Apple. From, it has been derived from both NextStep and the OpenStep API. Okay, so here's a brief comparison between C++, the other object-oriented programming language, versus Objective-C. So C++ is not just OOPS, it also has uh, metaprogramming and generic programming. Um, and this, although both were built on C, 
uh, this added um, you know you could generate code uh, basically you could uh, meta programming is like code gets generated at compile time and uh, these features uh, were not added um, with objective c so objective c only adds oops to c and regarding the uh, library, like we said yesterday, um, um, Objective-C does not have a standard library. So you have libraries from Apple and you have libraries from GNU. So it's dependent on other libraries. Whereas C++ comes with a standard library. And C++ is it's more uh, to do with a programmer from the you know computer science background and uh, it has numerous other uses whereas Objective-C is mostly used for application building. And uh, you would have, uh, if you have had a chance to look at C++ programs, they are large and they are complex and uh, you know they run into many pages whereas Objective-C has a much more simpler way of handling classes and objects. So those were the features and now if you look at the syntax, uh, what we have done is we have taken the example of a very basic uh, function signature, a function or a method, uh, its signature. We have compared these, uh, this in these two languages and the second comparison we have done is with the uh, object uh, method invocation. So if you see the first, uh, the function signature, in C++ it's the return type void. This is the return type of the function. So when you say void, it does not return anything. Followed by the function name. So this can be, say, for example, just to quote our previous uh, example, drive. And within the parenthesis is the signature of the function. So you have the number of uh, variables or the arguments uh, in order and uh, their data type followed by their name and uh, they are separated by commas right and they are followed by the semicolon now if you see in objective C it's a little bit more uh, lengthier and it's a little bit more verbose but um, it more or less it's uh, similar what are the differences so even before you mention the return type of this uh, function uh, there is a uh, minus sign here. So this can be either minus or plus. So the difference is when it's a minus it's an instance method meaning you have to instantiate a class, you have to create an object and then only then you can invoke this function. So you say object and then the function. But there is a feature wherein uh, if you put plus here then you can directly call the class method, the signature of the class and you do not have to instantiate an object in that case. So this is important, minus and the return type is enclosed within parenthesis followed by the function name and then there is a colon which means the function name is um, it stops here and then the first parameter comes into picture. Again, like the return type was enclosed in parenthesis, the first uh, parameter's data type is enclosed in parenthesis. Then there is a space and there is some, you know, some more um, uh, names. So what is this? Basically, if you see here, then uh, what do you think? I, I, I uh, release a question onto the floor. How many parameters does this function take? The uh, void is not the um, it's it's not the argument. It's the return type of the function. So don't get confused. Void is what the function returns, and the arguments are what it in it takes within it. It's the input to the function. So like here in C++, when you call the function, you need to pass three parameters and it will do something but it will not return any uh, variable. So similarly, even in Objective-C, this function is going to take three parameters. Then what are these? What is with where? What is with another where? So typically in Objective-C, the function name is split across the three 
different variables and um, this just makes it more uh, uh, it's uh, you know it's a meaningful way of giving a function name but at the same time splitting it across the different arguments so for example if I go back to Xcode and see here I and if you see the beauty of this uh, IDE is such that if I start typing something it will automatically start completing it for me so the autocomplete feature is very it's it's very powerful see for example I just typed VO and it already gave me two options with the um, appropriate uh, you know code completion so there is a closing bracket also so what I'll do is I can uh, through the arrow key I can toggle between the different choices and I press enter so void comes and then I just go to the next I use the next uh, the right arrow key and automatically I it completes it for me so there's very little uh, you know chance of uh, error and you do not have to keep on uh, looking to uh, documentation to uh, you know for help with your code so that's that's uh, the you know one of the features of this ID okay so now that I have said minus void so it means it's an instance method and the return type is null it does not return anything so let me see if there is any inbuilt function for this class right see so basically these are functions inbuilt functions for the view controller class and uh, this is from the framework from the SDK and um, let's let's take this um, add observer and I'll just double click it and it will come up and the way I uh, need to um, create the body is by opening and closing curly brackets and if I do an enter then the ID completes it for me okay so let's see so what is this function so uh, it's the name is add observer for key path and options and the context so this is the name of the function and at each point it takes in an NS object as the observer and for key path so it takes a key path which is an NS string and options when you say options then options is the name of the argument but the object type is ns key value observing options and the context context is this is the name and it's it's void so typically this is how a function is written this is the syntax of a function in objective c i will comment this or I, I'll delete this and uh, come back to our second point which is the method invocation so in C++ it it's uh, you use the dinner you use the dot so it's class uh, object dot function and then the uh, arguments and in objective C it's slightly different At the square brackets um, uh, the, the method call is enclosed within square brackets and because of the square bracket uh, the compiler knows it's a method call and then you um, write the name of the object and you uh, give a space and then the function name and pass the arguments so this is basically the dif difference in the syntax between these two Now let us look into the features of uh, Objective-C. Okay, so let's look at the other Objective-C features. Like I said, it's, uh, it uses dynamic typing, linking and binding. And um, yeah, so, um, so this allows greater flexibility and uh, the memory management for all these features is done by uh, the compiler and uh, the language and so it's easy on the programmer and and thus it's also easy on the RAM and the CPU usage 
Okay, Objective C 2.0. This version was released in October 2007 for the Mac operating system 10.5, which is Leopard. And in this version uh, uh, was added the automatic garbage collection. So like how you have um, garbage collection in Java, uh, memory management is done by uh, the compiler, the runtime, um, allocation, deallocation of objects, everything is taken care. The programmer doesn't have to explicitly, uh, you know, uh, allocate uh, objects, uh, memory to objects or release them. So this is a very good feature which got introduced with the 2.0 version. And also the property directive. Uh, basically earlier you had to um, create setter and getter methods for properties. Um, and you had to write explicit methods to access them. But with 2.0 it uh, the compiler does that for you. And uh, we will see how, how that is done a little bit later. But um, yeah. So this is where this is what we were talking about properties. So um, properties are um, it's uh, it's the um, state of an object in Objective C, and we do not access the instance variables directly in Objective C. Instead, we use properties. So the add the rate property is a directive compiler directive. And what it means is when we define an instance variable using this property, uh, the getter and setter method for it is automatically created. And the getter has the name um, of the property and the setter has a set uh, you know, attached to it. So for example, if you uh, have a property called as my value, then the getter will be the same my value and the setter will be set my value. So let us look into look at that. Yeah, let's say here yeah, when I say add property, see autocomplete is again helping me. And I say I just call n as object. My object. So what I have done here is I have created, um, basically I have um, created a property of the type n as object and I have set a pointer to it. So how will I access it? So when I come back to my implementation file and say within any uh, function within a method inside this implementation. If I say self, self is like the name says that particular class inside which we are right now. So self dot and the name of the property was my object, right? So if you see here automatically, automatically the um, there is a provision for you to access it, right? And so you can do that because the compiler has um, the, the um, Objective-C has gone ahead and created this, uh, the getter for you. So let me say nil. So when I say nil, it means it's, it's, it's a nil object, right? And if I have to set it, set my object. If you see here, see there is, I have not written this function at all, set my object, right? But it was written for me. So that's because I have earmarked this as a property. This is a property. So that's a very cool feature. And, um, and this is the method signature. So obviously when I set an object, I will take in um, an object which I will be setting, right? So let's say new object in 
in it. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a new object. I'm initializing it using the init keyword and then in the same line I'm allocating memory for it. So this is a very very important line that you will see here. There is an error. Let's let's just highlight this. Yeah, so it says any and the autocomplete, I, I did not press the enter, so that did not uh, reflect here. So let's go ahead and put in it. Okay. I am just commenting the second line because we'll come back to that. So when I use the init word, I am initializing an object of type n is object. And it is using the similar convention, right? Let me just break this down for you. NS object init is actually a method called to the init method of NS object class. So I use this method to initialize my object. And so it returns me an object. And with that object, I do another method called to alloc, which is the method for allocating memory to my object. So there are two method calls inside this. If you look carefully, there are two method calls here. One is for initialization, uh, initializing, sorry, and one is for allocating memory. So this is how you declare and initialize and allocate memory for your objects. Okay, so um, so basically the compiler is issuing a warning saying that you have you know, created an object, but you've not used it anywhere. So what I will do right now is use this object to set my class my object property, right? And very nicely Xcode does, does that for me also. And so when now I use this object which I have created here, the compiler warning goes away, right? So the compiler is there at every, at, you know, at each step to guide you, to help you, um, you know, make as few mistakes as possible. Okay, so the getter usually has the name of the property and the setter's name is set plus capitalized property name. So set my value and uh, to you, to you know, to have a good um, naming convention, you always use a lower case letter as the first letter of a property name. And we simply call this setter to store the value we want and the getter to get it. So this is just a first glimpse into the language and uh, we saw how we instantiate and um, create objects and how we also use uh, properties to automatically um, access and set uh, values for the instance variables. Now we'll go a little bit more deep and see what exactly happens uh, behind. Okay, so what I would like you to do right now is open your Xcode so the way you invoke it is, um, it comes on the dock automatically. Let me just quit this with Xcode. Yes. So right now you see, um, after you have installed it, it, uh, it comes on the dock. Or else you can use Spotlight to um, invoke it. So just type in Xcode and there you have it. So click on Xcode. And so right now on your uh, right hand pane you wouldn't have uh, any projects um, but if you have already developed or created a few projects there will be a snapshot of these on the right hand pane. So what you need to do is click on create a new Xcode project. And so it throws up, we have seen this yesterday when we created a project. Um, but I'll quickly walk you through the different uh, templates. Uh, basically, there is um, there are two groups. One is for iOS and one is for the OS 10 operating system. 
we will be focusing on iOS and the application because we're building apps and here we have a set of five different templates so this is uh, the master detail application is basically it um, there is a navigation controller which uh, you know which is a starting point and from there there is a hierarchical structure so you have a master and then uh, there are different detail views so if you if you want your app uh, you know to follow this architecture of this design then there is a ready-made template for you there is also a page based application like for example if you have an app where uh, you know you have to scroll through different pages say for example a reader app then you can make use of this template there are also tabbed applications where you have like say three different tabs um, or you know any number of tabs and you want to give that uh, kind of navigation for your uh, users you use this and of course a gaming uh, template which is a starting point for games but uh, the most thing the most uh, simple form of you know uh, application is the single view application and it's a good starting point for um, building apps so let's uh, click on this let's uh, select a single view application and click on next so uh, the product name we will give today is say let's say um, module 2 let's let's just name it uh, or you can give it any other name um, and the organization name as of now you can leave this empty it does not matter uh, what happens is when you uh, deploy your app, uh, all this come uh, in the bundle information. And this follows, uh, you know, a typical um, object-oriented programming uh, convention where um, it appends a com plus in front of your organization. And then the bundle identifier then becomes com dot the organization name and then the product name. Because this is the later version of uh, Xcode, you have the option of also developing this app in Swift. We will stick to Objective-C and by default iPhone or you can make it universal. So let's stick to iPhone and core data is when you have any kind of data uh, within your app. So for, as of now, we are not using it. So by default, it stays unchecked. Now let's click on next so here this is your uh, directory where you would like to save all your iOS projects uh, I recommend you create a folder called as iOS underscore projects and um, then start uh, creating projects inside that and by default this is uh, you know the JIT repository is created on my Mac for uh, your project and I would recommend that you keep it checked it, right now it does not matter but it's a good practice because um, JIT is a source control so tomorrow if you're working on uh, you know uh, a, if you're working in a team and um, obviously you would you know be using source control so it's a good uh, practice to keep this checked so let's go ahead and create the project Right, so um, when we create the project, Xcode has gone ahead and it's, uh, you know, created some files for you already. And uh, the main set of files here are the main dot st storyboard. This is your uh, UI builder, the UI of your app and uh, there is a small, uh, this is the hierarchy of the UI elements so as and when you start adding elements onto your app you will uh, see that they get added onto this uh, node structure here onto the left for now you can um, dismiss this pane, you can hide the document outline click on it and it goes so you have the UI interface here So when you select this, on the right hand side you have different, uh, you know, inspectors. You have a file inspector, you have a quick help inspector. Quick help is nothing but it 
through the information documentation about the class. Um, then you have the identity inspector, this is very important. Uh, then the attributes, this is also important. The size and the connections. So let us click on this. Um, so right now we have clicked on the whole interface. And if we click on the identity inspector, it shows the underlying class. So for example, if we uh, say, let us add a text field, right? So what I'm doing is I'm just typing in the initial letters of that uh, element or that UI control and you get these uh, options which match. Uh, it's a um, literal search so you get any uh, matches which correspond to TE. So what I'm interested in is the text field element and uh, this is basically a text field like any other form. So I will hold this and drag and drop it onto the view. So what I have here right now is a text field and let's see how the document outline has changed. Show document outline. Yes. So within my view controller scene there is a view controller and within that there's a top layout guide, there's a bottom layout guide and the canvas for me as the app developer is within the view. And here I have a round style text field. So this is how I can go about highlighting each of these controls. Or I can simply click on it. When I click on it and I see on the right hand pane, uh, let's say for example if I see the identity inspector, then it shows me the text field, the underlying class that this text field corresponds to. So it's a UI text field. So like we said yesterday in Cocoa Touch, we have this all these frameworks which correspond to the UI elements. So for text field, the underlying class in the framework is UI text field. Excuse me. And the framework that it belongs to is the UI kit framework. So this is how you um, identify the underlying classes. And on the help, uh, quick help inspector, if you click, then it gives you information or documentation about the UI text field. And you have appropriate links, so you can click on these and it takes you to the uh, documentation. UI text field with the Apple documentation. Right? file inspector is main dot storyboard. So this is my file. Note that I'm still uh, selected the UI text field. So now I go from there to the attributes inspector. So now what you see here are a set of attributes corresponding to the text field, the text field uh, control. And here um, you know, these are very um, good uh, features. You can change your uh, look and feel of the um, app UI. So you can change the color. Say so you can change it to blue. So any kind of data you can also put in say um, um, default message say enter some text. So you can expand it. or you can change the size or you can change the font you can click here and you can change the font you can change the um, font face you can make it bold italic done and you can also align it.
right? So these are some cool features that you can use to design your elements. And the size inspector. So if you see, it changes when I, I you know, change this. But if you have very specific requirements, uh, then you can put in those numbers here directly. So basically, that's how we go about, um, you know, adding uh, and um, editing elements on the canvas on the main face of the uh, storyboard. So that is this main dot storyboard file, and then you have the uh, you have a view controller uh, class which has a header file and an implementation file, the corresponding implementation file. So like we said yesterday, if you, um, coming back to our MVC pattern, the way this is linked is by um, tying this view out here this whole view controller with the underlying class. Right? And um, so yesterday we also saw how we tied in these um, uh, IB outlets and IB actions with our main storyboard. So we can just go ahead and do that again here. Uh, the most important thing is you have to switch over from the implementation to the header file and you click within this uh, you, uh, within the text field and with the other hand keep the control button pressed and drag and drop this. Please try this with me and uh, see these are all like you know you need practice you keep on doing it and then uh, eventually it becomes uh, you know easier for you so i'd highly recommend that highly recommend that uh, you know you do this with me so what i'm doing is i'm creating an outlet for the text field and keeping with the naming convention we we'll, uh, we will say txt and say some text right and click on connect so now it becomes a property and uh, so because of by virtue of it being a property we can access this field and we can also set values for it So that is the significance of these two files. And we have uh, appdelegate.h and appdelegate.m. Appdelegate is the class which is basically, it's basically concerned with your app lifecycle. So if you see the implementation file, it has a set of methods corresponding to each um, stage of, you know, your app. So uh, the first one is application did finish launching, win, launching, launching with options. So any kind of customization that you would want to do after the application launch, the first time the app launches on your um, device screen, you will uh, put the code there in this part, within this method. And then there are methods for um, you know when they move from one state to the other so uh, application will resign active so when it moves from active to inactive state or uh, when the application enters the background say for example sometimes you may go from your app into uh, say a browser or say into another app like for example Facebook so in these cases if you would like to do any kind of housekeeping or any you know um, other specific things you will be overriding this method and you will be including the code for that. So these are some different um, methods at the app level, at the life cycle level. And then so app delegate is this is the significance. Now the main file is main.m and if you look at this file it's a very simple piece of code there's only one line and uh, if you see the um, 
signature of this function it's very similar to your main function right you have seen this before so let's look at this so basically this is the entry point for your app your entire app is contained within this function and uh, the it takes in two parameters one is uh, our ERGC which is an integer and it is the number of argument values passed and ERGV this is a character array and it holds the actual values passed and the most important line here to remember is this the at auto release pool so basically it holds a reference to the pool memory and all objects in uh, objective C are you know they are allocated on the heap and not on the stack so uh, if you have uh, read about uh, memory management heap is you know where you store things that need to outlive the current function call so that is uh, you know and stack is where you know as soon as the scope ends the object uh, life it's you know it's thrown out of the stack so the main important thing to remember is that in Objective-C all objects are created on the heap and not on the stack. Of course in C++ you can create it both on the stack as well as, uh, sorry, stack as, well as heap and um, stack object allocation is faster as uh, you know the compiler does all the bookkeeping for you so during runtime everything is known so there is no fear of memory leakage or you know uh, any kind of um, illegal referencing because all objects are destroyed at the end of the scope however it also means that there is not much of flexibility and um, objects have a single owner which is a function that created them right but in heap you can have uh, multiple owners and the objects still stick around even after the function call and uh, earlier before ARC was implemented in Objective-C uh, the programmer had to uh, explicitly relinquish uh, ownership uh, using certain keywords like retain release etc but uh, now with ARC that is also done automatically for you and um, so it's you know it's it's um, there is no fear of uh, you know illegal uh, reference or uh, you know incorrect reference counting and so on so these are concepts that you know um, don't necessarily um, uh, you know you um, you will not be um, uh, asked to uh, you know um, do this when you're doing app development but it's good to know it's good to know the uh, you know the reason why um, things are in a certain way in this language uh, the other thing is um, yes here you see a ns log um, function right so this is the logging method so basically it outputs uh, it into the uh, console by default uh, you can also output the log into a file but you will have to explicitly create file objects and uh, pass uh, certain parameters to the functions uh, but by default if you if you you know invoke this ns log and pass it a string uh, using the at uh, directive so it says hello edureka students and return zero so by default it returns zero so if you do that then you will get an output so let's see let's just um, write this this log okay. students okay so now let's run our program the the command to first build it is here in product menu you click on build so build will compile it for you so any kind of compile time error will be 
uh, highlighted at this point in time. So it says build come succeeded and then now we can run it. So either we use product run or we can click on this. So when you when you run this uh, app in Xcode it will invoke the simulator. So let's see how it does that. Right, so uh, first and foremost we see there is some output in our output console here and like I said the program entered from the main file. This is the entry point of the program and as soon as we uh, it encountered this line it has outputted this hello Eureka students. So this is a good way of you know um, debugging your code and trying to find out uh, you know using a log statements at appropriate places where and at what time it has reached. You can also monitor your app performance by putting log statements. So um, this is a typical uh, you know uh, usage of log statements using NSLog. So you would want to use this when you know you have uh, you are trying to find out which part of your app in case it's you know it's a very big app which uses a lot of data which part of your app is you know uh, consuming a lot of resources etc. And there are many other features of using the NSLog statement. Okay, now coming back to our simulator, um, you, on the dock you will see the iOS simulator. So you can click on it and it comes back. Right. So here we see that our layout is such that you know the text field is shifted a little bit to the right. And also what we saw was when we launched the app, um, there was a message saying module 2. Right. So this is the launch screen. And by default the launch message is the name of the project. So we will quickly look into how to uh, configure these two, how to change this um, the UI and also how to change the welcome message. So let's go back to coding. We can do that by stopping the simulator using the square button. Let's stop it. Right. So the simulator goes. Okay, so let's go back to main dot storyboard and let's see what's the issue here. We will hide the right hand pane and also the output console. And we'll show the document outline. Yes. So there is this auto layout feature. I did mention this briefly yesterday. Excuse me. So basically auto layout is used for uh, you know typically um, uh, helping the programmer and what it does is it, um, uh, it, it adjusts the layout so that you know it's um, it moves from one device to the other uh, and there's not many, you know, there's not a lot of change uh, between these two. So it takes like the, uh, you know, the um, best layout for a number of devices. So all the supported devices actually. So um, a good idea would be to disable this. Let's say it's disable size classes because using size classes requires auto layout. And so when you um, uncheck the auto layout, use auto layout uh, uh, feature, then you get this pop-up. You can go ahead and do that right now. Disable size classes. Okay. Right. So you see it's, you know, it's, uh, now you can see that, you know, it's almost shifted towards the right. And so you'll pull it here. 
and if you see the blue lines they are kind of you know uh, they guide you based on you know the center the topmost and you know the top um, margin the bottom margin the middle um, the section so it's good to use these as your guides and so I'll drop it at the center now let's run it right so it's still not exactly in the center but it is much better so yes yeah, so we can keep uh, you know changing this and I'd suggest that you uh, you know uh, get your hands free um, with Xcode and start uh, you know using all these features and try and make little bit changes and see how it uh, you know affects so you become more comfortable with uh, the ID and the entire uh, uh, you know structure I hope uh, uh, you are doing all this with me right now um, okay so the other thing that we uh, wanted to change was the uh, launch message so for that you have uh, you have a file here which says launch screen right launch screen dot zip so by default it's it's got a neat it's it's it takes the name of the project and it has also got a copyright message neat copyright message down which has taken the uh, current year the the year of development and the company name so let's change this and say uh, welcome to module to demo right Okay. okay, so the change is not getting reflected. Let's see. Right. So sometimes it it you know it gives you these um, it it just throws you off guard the ID. It's just a matter of being patient and getting used to it. And um, also a good um, uh, you know idea would be to keep cleaning your files uh, after you know um, a certain uh, amount of development and running. It's you know intermittently you have to keep cleaning your files. Uh, that's a good practice to follow. So, yes, yeah, so that's it. So we have um, created um, a project and we have uh, seen the different files that uh, get created automatically for you when you create a project using the single view application template. And um, yes, um, supporting files. Yeah, so this is the bundle information that gets, um, you know, so when you create the project, uh, the bundle identifier was what gets created here. And uh, info.plist is another list, it's another file which has uh, some parameters for the executables. But the main thing to remember here is uh, the entry point for the program and the signature for the main uh, function. Okay, so now let us take an example of a class and uh, how it is um, implemented in Objective-C. So uh, we are taking an example of a spaceship that orbits around the planet. So let's just go ahead and create uh, these two files. 
say in uh, your Xcode, click on File and click on New and New File. And here you will click on iOS Source. You click on Coco Touch class. Next. And by default it is a subclass of NS object, but you can also extend it from any other class, existing class. We'll keep it as NS object and we will call it spaceship. And the directory would be inside the project. So you have these two files created for you. Right, so this is the uh, interface, the header file and this is the implementation. Right now there is no code. Right, so in this case what um, we have done in this example is we have already uh, a vehicle superclass and um, so generally uh, this is actually the UI kit slash UI kit dot h that is the superclass from which you would extend your uh, subclass you would subclass so for this example just to keep it you know uh, in sync with our uh, uh, spaceship uh, analogy we have created a vehicle class and from that vehicle we have derived the spaceship subclass so the convention is um, you write the class name uh, the colon and the superclass from which is it, from which it is extended but most important is you have to uh, import the header file for this superclass so if you see here what we have done is we have imported the foundation foundation slash foundation dot h and uh, we can look at uh, the header file of foundation so um, just as we saw yesterday you have to click on the project um, uh, the topmost uh, structure and it um, and go to general and keep um, scrolling down till you come to linked frameworks and bind libraries and click on the plus sign and uh, foundation you can just type this so you will get a match and you add it so I just wanted to show you the foundation.h file right so within this is the NS object yes here here is the NS object And so that's how you, uh, these are the two things that you have to remember. You have to import that particular uh, header file which contains this um, class and you extend the subclass using this convention. And meanwhile in the implementation file, you will be importing the corresponding header file and that's done automatically for you. So you will not be uh, doing anything but this is the convention. So it says import spaceship.h and this is the implementation body between at the rate implementation at end the between this block is where you will be implementing this class and uh, note that there is no uh, specific uh, notation here there's no superclass specified here because that has already been done in the header file okay so what are these two files for so the header file has got the declaration of all public methods and variables and the implementation files, uh, the implementation file, the .m file has the implementation of the public as well as the private methods. So the interface has just the skeletal structure and the code is actually within the implementation. And how do we uh, include the private methods? We do that by uh, extending the interface inside the implementation file using this convention so we write at interface spaceship but the difference is that here we you know we show the hierarchy with the superclass or if there is you know no superclass then by default um, 
you will have the NS object. So that remains. But here, what you do is, before the implementation, you will write at interface page ship and open and close brackets and at end. So within this block, you will declare all the private methods. Note that the implementation will still come here. Even for private methods, you will have to implement them here. But you declare them at this point above the implementation directive. So here we just add by default the implementation directive. But if you want to include any private methods, this is how we do it. So for a client of this class, they still do not, they cannot see the private methods. They, and they cannot access them as well. This is internal. These are internal to this implementation. Okay, so now for spaceship, for the spaceship class to work, we also need to import the planet class. So we do that uh, similar to how we have imported the vehicle header file. So we go ahead and import the planet header file. And why do we need to implement uh, import the planet uh, header file? Because we have to declare a method uh, in the spaceship class which is orbit planet at altitude. So this uh, spaceship uh, has a method which um, takes in a planet and a uh, altitude and uh, the function actually does the orbiting. So it orbits the planet. So the full name of this method is orbit planet at altitude and it takes in two arg arguments. One is the planet object, which planet you have to orbit and the second one is at what altitude. And see, uh, like we, you know, had this discussion on the uh, method name, <clears throat> each um, argument is preceded by its own keyword. So um, it's a void return type, so it does not return any value. So what we have done here, uh, the, diff the, the addition that we have done here is we have gone ahead and declared a method. We have imported a planet because the method uses that. And uh, we have imported the header file for that object. And we have gone ahead and declared a method which uses this object. And then in the corresponding implementation file, we have to write the code. We have to implement this method. So note that everything else remains the same except that the semicolon is uh, replaced by open and close curly brackets because this is where you will be putting the code to orbit a planet. So now what we have done is we have also gone ahead and created, um, declared um, a couple of other things in the interface file. Uh, a function, a method called as set top speed and it takes in a double um, value which is the percent of speed of light. So you pass in a percentage of the speed of light and that is the, um, that in turn is used to set the top speed for uh, the spaceship and um, there is also um, the getter function or uh, you know the, the, the variable, the top speed variable. So we are actually uh, coming to the getter and setter uh, feature but uh, we are doing this from the opposite direction like from the need for you know setting this. So we have top speed and then we have set top speed. And in the implementation, you see that you have to um, uh, write the same method signature and uh, these are placeholders for the code for the implementation. Right. So now we come to the property directive, which we saw earlier. So basically, it just essentially declares the two top speed methods below. So when you say add property, non-atomic, double top speed, automatically it gives you the getter and the setter. Now the significance here is uh, the new keyword called as non-atomic uh, which means that uh, the setter and the getter are not thread safe uh, which means they can be shared but um, that is not a problem because what we saw here was that um, this is the starting point of our application, um, the main and uh, so everything happens within this one thread. So the whole, all these classes, the storyboard and the app delegate, the view control, everything is executed within this 
uh, thread and so it does not matter it is uh, you know there is not going to be any inter thread communication uh, etc so we can still go ahead and maintain this as non atomic right so what we have done is we have just gone ahead and created a property called as double uh, top speed now what is the implication of that Yes, so this was just to show you uh, that uh, the equivalence of creating property is basically these two and uh, we earlier saw it in our Xcode so I hope it's clear um, and hence it's written that we never declare both property and the setter and the getter because it's a uh, property does that for you. Yes, and uh, at synthesize if you know basically it was uh, in earlier versions when you uh, created a property uh, you had to use at synthesize to create the implementation of the setter and getter for that property and um, it also creates some storage to hold the value so what happens is uh, you go to the implementation file and use this line so you say at synthesize uh, this property name is equal to underscore top speed so this is the top sp underscore top speed is the instance variable corresponding to this property and using this synthesize we are you know setting this property to this instance variable and this is a common naming convention to show that it's an instant variable so um, but uh, as of now uh, with the latest version of um, Xcode and iOS uh, we saw right we have not written this at synthesized top speed you know we have not explicitly gone and uh, you know declared it to be the instance variable the corresponding instance variable it, it is done automatically for you so but in earlier code earlier versions of the code you will still see something like this so it means that it was set at that point in time but as of now you do not have to uh, do it and when you when you use this synthesize this is how the this is the underlying implementation this is what happens at the background so when you create a property named as top speed it gets in synthesized to the underlying instance variable which is denoted by underscore the variable name and in turn the setter and the getter methods um, they uh, so the setter method sets the instance variable to the uh, variable that has been passed to it and the getter method returns the instant variable. So this is what happens at the background. So most of the time you can let um, this automatically be done. The synthesize takes care of the uh, setter and the getter but you can also override this um, implementation and um, the way to do it is you will um, you know you uh, will write the signature of the setter method which is uh, nothing but uh, it's a return type is void because you're setting and you're not returning anything but you're taking in a uh, the speed parameter and uh, the setter method name is set and the name of the property so set top speed and um, what you can do is here we have specified certain um, outer and uh, inner limits and we say if speed is less than one and speed is greater than zero only then you set the top speed to speed. So we can do these kind of customizations also. We can go ahead and override the default getter and set, setter methods. So now let us look at uh, you know introducing a property in the private space of the um, interface. So we have declared a property called as uh, wormhole and uh, but this declaration does not happen in the interface file uh, but it happens within the implementation file now why is this because this is a private property it is used internally by the spaceship class so it need not be exposed to uh, the outside world so this is a very good uh, feature to have we will come back uh, we will see how later uh, but any kind of uh, you know private methods uh, have to be declared within uh, in this area okay so um, so what it does is uh, it does a couple of things one is uh, it's a pointer to an object of class wormhole and uh, the second thing is it's it's uh, non non 
atomic, um, comma strong. So there are two uh, types of uh, properties. One is um, uh, strong and one is weak. So when you say weak, it means uh, the uh, ARC, um, uh, the uh, you know at at the time of um, uh, you know garbage collection, it can uh, it will see if um, any object is. Such time that the programmer explicitly deallocates the significance of uh, the strong keyword here, and like as gets this memory through code. Then before all objects are always allocated on the heap, and uh, and that's the reason why we need to access them through a pointer. So if you see, typically in C or in Java, you would uh, say a corresponding statement um, would be ns string, uh, just the variable name, is equal to uh, the string, right? So let's go to Xcode and see. See here in the implementation file. create a method, declare a method here. Right, so uh, my function name is get some data and it's inputting a string um, and it does not return anything. So let's go and implement this here. So if you see in Java, um, say we would be writing something like this string str is equal to str data. just pointers and why is that because they are all so any object allocated on will be accessed through its pointer and say if we were to the heap uh, you know hard code this to a little then again that's the reason we use the address sign here and then um, and we give a string, a pass, we pass in a string. And so we, um, like, like we mentioned earlier, the advantage of uh, allocating objects on heap is, uh, you know, having that extra flexibility and that is where all this, um, you know, dynamic linking and dynamic binding, etc., all these features come in uh, into Objective-C. And um, also there is no fear of um, memory leaking or uh, illegal reference because uh, it is done via uh, ARC for you. Um, so this is the reason why you need to um, have a pointer reference to your variables in Objective-C. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, the main thing here is to note that um, this uh, synthesize does not allocate any room for, um, uh, you know, it does not create any storage for the object. It just creates, uh, allocates room for the pointer. And uh, we'll, uh, you know, we already saw how to allocate and initialize objects. So now just let's take a look at some example coding. And um, so far we have seen, um, you know, for quite a few examples of uh, the Objective-C language and its syntax. But right now we'll be going a little bit more further. And um, yes, we have already seen how we will be invoking um, class functions and methods using the square bracket syntax. So that's what we're doing here. So we call the, uh, you know, uh, top speed, self top speed. So this is uh, used to send messages. So this is a square bracket. So whenever you do a method call, you need to uh, enclose it within square brackets. So that is a convention here. And the other way to do it is with the dot uh, connotation. So that also works. So for example, here if you see, you could also do this as self dot top speed. So bo both work. So str, um, sorry, txt some text is our property. And we can either do self dot txt some text or we can do a self sorry set txt some text so both work so you can either use the dot notation or you can use the square brackets So this is the way you comment your code, uh, very typical to, uh, you know, other IDEs um, and uh, other languages, sorry, Java, etc. And if you want to comment the whole block, then again you use the same convention. And uh, another cool feature of the ID is, uh, you know, you can, within a class, you can navigate to these different methods. So if you have a really big, uh, huge class, then uh, instead of navigating through all this, you can go through this. Like, for example, say the um, app delegate dot um, implementation. So, And there are some uh, directives like um, which make your uh, code very modular. For example, there is a pragma directive. Methods. So okay, so. Let's see what this is. Yes. So what this does is basically, uh, so this is the syntax, uh, hash pragma mark. Right? So this is uh, like, you know, it's, it's um, so you bundle whatever helper methods that you are writing. Um, say for example, if these are methods that you have created and they're not part of the class, uh, like say for example, um, let's say, um, get some data, right? So this is a helper method and uh, this is not overriding anything of the um, UI view controller class. Whereas if you see, um, did receive memory warning and view.load, these are extending the, uh, these are basically overriding the 
classes of the uh, base class of the UI view controller. And right now, of course, we are not overriding because we are just calling, uh, we are doing a call to the super and um, so it's basically um, exactly not overriding. But um, what I would, you know, what I wanted to show you was in case you are writing methods which are, you know, very specific to this class, so which are like, you know, you, you can call them helper methods or, you know, you can call them uh, specific methods to do, say, um, any kind of housekeeping or something. So you can just write that here. And the way to do that is using the pragma directive. So when you are navigating through the file, um, you know, you can just go into this, you can click here or you can click here um, and you know you get um, it just takes you here so it just takes you to this file so some nice to know features of uh, the ID okay so here we see we saw how we have uh, been uh, declaring the getter and the setter, setter methods how we have used them how we have accessed them and uh, the property directive And here's another example of sending a message. Uh, it looks like this method has two arguments, a planet to travel to and a speed to travel at. And it is being sent to an instance of a wormhole. So let's see what is happening here. So this uh, method has uh, two arguments. So the first one is a planet, travel, top, travel to planet at speed. This is the method and it takes in an argument. Uh, the first one is of uh, type planet object and the second is speed which is a double and it returns a wormhole object. Right? And the way uh, even the wormhole object has been referenced is by using the wormhole of this particular, the private uh, property that we saw earlier, the nearest wormhole. So we call this function, we got a wormhole and we have assigned it to the wormhole of this spaceship. So we have done two things in this, uh, in this single line. So, um, so this is how we, uh, you know, this is the syntax of Objective C and uh, we have called two methods basically and uh, using the square bracket convention. So this is square brackets inside square brackets. And like I said, we can also use the dot notation to access this um, the property variable. So um, calling getters and setters is, is such an important task. It has its own syntax. It's got a dot notation. And this is basically identical to self uh, space top speed within square brackets. So this is a typo. It's actually self space top speed or set top speed actually. And uh, similarly, like we had, um, you know, uh, called the nearest wormhole uh, property using uh, the square brackets earlier. We can do away with that and we can use the dot notation here as well. So we can either use this dot So hash import and hash include, right? So these are two directives. Um, if you see here in foundation.h you have both. You have hash import and hash include. So what is the difference? Typically hash include is used uh, for C files and um, what, what, is the, um, what happens is when you uh, use hash include and you uh, insert the header file, then the entire code is um, duplicated onto your, um, you know, file. And this happens even if it's already been added before. And on the other hand, hash import checks if uh, there is code already present from vehicle.h and if it has been, then it will not duplicate it. So the second point is the um, class in Objective C. Every class has two parts: the .m, the uh, the .h, the interface, and the implementation, the .m. And the interface files define the public interface between instances of classes and the outside world. And the implementation files include the actual code, the executable code for each method declared in the interface, and they come with the .m extension. 
and almost every object manipulation is done by sending objects a message. Uh, exception to this rule is um, the plus sign wherein you use that to invoke the uh, method of a class. So otherwise it's, um, it's there are two words within a set of brackets. The first one is the object and the second one is the message and uh, these are enclosed within the square bracket. So this is a syntax for message and we have seen various examples and uh, this is also uh, because of the dynamic binding feature and the message and the receiver are joined at runtime. And as we saw before, uh, objects are uh, created dynamically through the keyword alloc and um, they are dynamically deallocated using words release and auto release. Of course now uh, in the latest version it is dealloc and um, none of these words are built in meaning uh, you know they are not a part of the NS object file. Um, so auto release deallocates the object once it goes out of scope. So if you see the example, the main uh, file has an auto-release pool and so whatever objects um, run within your app, run within this thread and uh, when the program exits, then uh, the memory, uh, the objects are uh, removed and memory is deallocated for them. So that is in a nutshell the memory allocation as it happens with Objective-C. Yes, we already, uh, you know, mentioned this. Uh, when declaring or implementing functions for a class, they must begin with a plus or a minus and the plus sign indicates a class method uh, and that can only be used by the class itself. So in other words, they are private functions and uh, the minus sign indicates instance methods uh, which we used. Um, okay, so um, as you have seen yesterday and today also, every object in, um, uh, in Objective-C has a clearly defined task. It is either a model which is, uh, you know, modeling which has uh, specific information, it is a placeholder for certain data or it's a view which is displaying visual content to the user or a controller which is controlling the flow of information between all these three. So. Um, an interface of the class defines what tasks it can do and um, we might want to extend an existing class and add uh, some specific behavior which can be used only in certain situations. Like uh, for example, we have uh, you know a class uh, which is there in the framework and um, what we would like to do is add certain functionality. So we may not want some uh, attributes but we may want it to do something extra. So um, the first thought in you know everyone's mind is why not subclass it, right? But just to have uh, added functionality does not make sense to subclass it because uh, what happens with the previous reference to the classes? We may have to you know go back and change them to the new subclass just because we want to use the added functionality, right? So that is not a very um, good solution. Uh, and that is why in these kind of situations we have uh, language specific features in Objective-C and these are uh, op uh, categories and extensions. So what are these? Let's, let's uh, take uh, categories first. So categories are basically adding, uh, you know, when you define a category, you're actually adding methods to an existing class. So this is an easier way to add extra functionality to that class without subclassing it. And uh, categories can be de declared for any class. Uh, they can be classes which you have created or they can be classes which are part of the framework or for part of the SDK. And you do not need to know the original implementation source code. So that's how you can write a category even for say a Cocoa Touch class. And categories will be available to all instances of original classes and its subclasses. So it's, it's almost like you're changing the, uh, you're adding of uh, extra functionality to the class file itself. So any classes which, uh, you know, uh, are uh, derived from this uh, uh, class, also will be able to access the new methods that you have written in the category. So that's a very good feature. 
and uh, these changes are made at runtime. So basically there is no difference between uh, you know calling uh, a method in uh, the actual class or a method in the category. So the runtime does not differentiate between these two uh, methods. So let's take an example. Let's say we have a person object and um, say there are two properties first name and last name and uh, what we want to do is we need to display the full name of this person and we do not have an implementation um, to write that method in this person class so like we said before subclassing this just to get the full name doesn't make any sense we are not adding any property or you know we're not changing um, you know, its state uh, and this is an excellent candidate for cat uh, adding a category to. So by this we can use a method which will append both the first name and the last name and we can access it anytime. Let's see how we do that. So the syntax is interface class name category name end and it is generally declared in a special header file and the name of the file would be the class name plus the category name dot h and dot m. So let's go ahead and add this here in Xcode. And let's close these uh, header files. Let's go to File, New, File, and then we will click on Objective C file. Click Next. The file type here is Category. And the class we are extending is car, same. So let's say that, you know, uh, we are adding some maintenance function to a car class. Right, so we already have the car class. Now what we have done is, Okay, let's see the com compiler is crying because it cannot find interface declaration for car, right? Because we have not imported the car file. So let's just go ahead and do that. Let's just quickly create a class. Yes, and here we'll import the car dot h. Okay, so the error goes. Um, let's see. So what we did was we added a category and um, okay so you must be wondering why did the car file come so sometimes the ID um, it does not uh, you know connect the current project and um, what I had done was uh, earlier before the session started I had created uh, another project in which I had created a category so uh, that project already had a class file so sometimes the ID does that, you know, it's, um, you know, it will give you the car class and so you have to, uh, you know, understand um, that the compiler is crying because you have not included a reference and it cannot find the uh, super class from which this has been extended to as a category. So the moment I imported uh, that file and I included the class here, the error went away. Okay, so as you see, we created the file, the category file here using new file, objective C file. We used a category and here we selected the class which we wanted to extend, right? And when we did that and we created uh, the file, we got two um, sets of file. One is the um, interface and one is the implementation of this category. So the name utility category uh, for a person class would uh, look like this. So they have basically imported uh, person.h 
and um, the category name here is name utility. In our case, it's maintenance, so that is basically the difference, but the convention is the same. And so inside this, what they have done is they have, uh, in the header file, they have declared the function which will append the first name and the last name to give the full name. So this is the functionality that was not there in the parent class. And using a category, we have extended that functionality. So now this uh, implementation for this will have to be uh, coded within the .m file here. And here you can see uh, using the string with format function uh, of any string class, um, this uh, first name and the last name has been appended. So uh, this is the format uh, specifier for a, for a string, um, percentage at the rate, and this is basically the pointer for allocating this whole string variable. And these are the parameters for each of these formats specifically, the placeholders for the formats. And because this class already has a property for each of this first name and last name, we could access it using the dot notation. So I hope it's clear how we were able to call this function, uh, create a category, and then um, write the, ex ex you know, the um, additional functionality to uh, address our uh, requirement. Right? So now this get full name string, this, this function which has been uh, declared in the header file of this category will be accessible to all classes, uh, to all objects of person class and also to all objects which have also to all classes which have uh, been subclassed from person dot edge. And how we access it is very simply during runtime. It, it is the same as calling person dot get full name string. So you do not mention the uh, you know the name of the category. You just call it as if it were a function which was defined within the person class, right? Okay, so basically the uses are you add methods to existing files and uh, the implementation of a complex class can be split across files, right? So um, if there is a class which um, requires certain functionalities in specific cases, so you can have separate category files for each case and you need not clutter the whole class with all the extra functionality which probably, uh, you know, uh, it may not be required in all cases. And you can also provide different implementations for the category methods to use in OS X or iOS. So you can have this, uh, you know, you can have it support uh, different uh, devices, different platforms. Yes, but uh, the thing to, um, you know, watch out for is we cannot add properties or instance variables to categories. We can only add methods. So the compiler will not warn you about this, but it will not work. So um, rule of thumb, just for adding um, functionality, um, categories are used. And the other thing to remember is you should not have the same category name as the class name. So you cannot have something like, you know, car, car. That will not work and for obvious reasons because this might generate unpredicted behavior at runtime, right? And uh, so also uh, what you need to remember is you should not be overriding existing methods in a base class. So in a category, um, inside a category, um, you would need to stick to methods which you're adding new and please do not override existing methods. If you want to override them, uh, use them, use that within a subclass because uh, categories are not hierarchical like subclass, they are more flat. It's a flat organization structure. So if you override an existing method, um, then there's no way for the compiler to know which method to call. So subclassing is almost always a better option in such a situation. Okay, so there is another thing called as extensions and we actually had a look at extensions uh, some time before. Um, they are very similar to category. Again, they are used uh, for adding to a class but this time we need to have the source code for these classes. 
so the difference between categories and extensions is that uh, categories can be added to any class uh, irrespective of whether we have the source code but for extensions we need the source code and it is compiled at the same time as the class and where are the methods declared it's not an additional file but it's declared within the implementation block and so because you need to have the source code you cannot have extensions for a framework class and the syntax is very similar it's at the rate interface and the class name but you have these brackets here and uh, you have to add the end directive to uh, you know notify the end of the block and since they do not have any name they can also be called as anonymous categories so extensions can also be called as anonymous categories because they do not have a specific name they are actually um, written within the implementation block and yes we can also add properties and instance variables to our extension so um, now let us try to add a new property address to our person class and uh, so the final extension would look like this uh, it's of type ns string so you have a pointer to the address uh, variable and the compiler because of uh, property directive it will automatically synthesize relevant accessor methods getter and setter methods for it and the implementation is written uh, the interface block is written inside the implementation file this whole block is written within the implementation file and so the users are primarily uh, to hide private data and add any property or variable that is declared in the interface uh, uh, to add any property or variable because uh, those that are declared in the interface have a public scope and uh, all methods and variables um, in an extension are accessible in any class which imports a class sorry all methods and variables um, within um, the interface file are accessible to any class which imports a class because they have a public scope but on the other hand uh, methods and variables which are uh, declared within extension have a private scope so so basically that is the main usage of uh, extensions